Hey, Spuddies, Potato McWhiskey here, and welcome back to Let's Play Humankind again in this sponsored tutorial series. I think we've made a lot of progress. We've learned a lot of things. We are ready to enter into a new era as well. However, I personally think that you should only ever really rush into the next era if you're at risk of not getting a save that you really, really need or want. But if you don't get it it's not the end of the world typically there's no like sieve here that i would be like oh man if i don't get this sieve i just lose the game every single one of these sieves presents an opportunity for you so i i, I would personally always maybe err on the side of looking for opportunities to get more fame um, and that's kind of what i'm going to be doing here in this game now there is an option to rush through the errors it's, it's an option but it's one you don't have to take and i think one, one of the criticisms that people actually had of this game is um they felt like the errors moved too quickly compared to the technology pace of the game and i think that was really just down to people feeling like they had to rush through the game when they they really didn't like you don't have to do that you don't have to go and, and, and rush your way through these errors so we're building up a little bit of a food income in here we're getting Getting a 57% growth rate, that's like a population every two turns. I think that's fine. We can leave it at that level. The city will grow relatively quickly now. I will need more food um, as time goes on. But I think for now, that's uh, that's totally fine. And we can maybe focus on something else like getting our new unique district up, which is incredibly valuable. Here we go. There's a plus 10 gold and plus 13 influence. I would like to be on the lookout for luxury resources that I could place this next to. Because it counts as a market quarter, it actually gets the benefit from them. But 13 influence right here is very strong. So we're going to get started on that one. And then another one. Ooh, nine influence right there. All right, 10 gold, nine influence. Get me all of these, please. I think 10 gold, nine influence is the baseline for this. But 10 gold, nine influence is nothing to, to turn your nose up at. Um, so we'll, we'll build three of those. Maybe we'll build all four just for the sake of it. Although, no, I might, I might not do that, actually. In Thebes, I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to get to work on all of these. And in fact, there's a perfect spot right here for a 13 gold, 11 influence. And then another 13 gold, nine influence one. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm working on these pretty much everywhere that it's available to me. Just because the power, the power of the Satrap's Palace is, is quite unmatched. Now in this city, it's actually going to take a very, very long time. So I may come in here and like prioritize other things like production and growth first. Looks like a war between the Mayans and the Greeks ended. And man, it looks like the Greeks came out on top there. The Mayans lost Kerma. I believe Kerma was the name of their city when they were the Nubians. And I think this plan here just isn't working out. So I'm going to like retreat this army and reorganize um, into a new plan. I'm probably just straight up attack these guys before they get much more powerful. Because I'm at sort of a zenith of my power level right now. And I want to take advantage of that while I still can. Otherwise, I'm just doing a lot of a lot of satraps, palaces, a lot of basic infra. You know, the usual kind of stuff that you might expect. Nice. So we researched conquest. So attaching outposts to our cities is a little bit cheaper. And we also have access to games, which is a repeatable project that gives you stability. Now, repeatable projects do get more expensive the more times you do them. So let's have a look at what we can do here. So they attacked me. They attacked me. They attacked me. I can start adding demands. These are worth a thousand gold each so let's add these demands they also get to add demands but i'm feeling i'm quite a bit stronger than them so if i declare war however before i declare war actually i should take a moment here to come into memphis and maybe just get a couple of a couple of units to act as defenders of the north here because if if an enemy if an enemy army just kind of comes from mykene and decides to attack my capital. I actually don't have units in the area. So I'll start producing an army here first before I um, get the war declared and I'll let these guys heal up. We have a new civic, press freedom. So we can make it cheaper to reduce, we can make it cheaper to cancel a civic or enact a civic, or we can prevent any empire revolution. Um, I don't think I want to do any of that just yet. Let us declare the war on these guys. Boom, we're now at war with the Mycenaeans. The war resolution here, we can propose by peace or we can surrender, but we are not going to do either. Uh, now, because we are the declarer of the war, our war support is going down quickly. It's, it's two per turn, one from being the person who declared the war. And I think the proximity state as attacker means I'm close to them or something. I, I'm not sure how that works. Um, but basically, I am the one who's going to lose this war after a certain amount of time. And so it's up to me to, to carry the momentum of the war. 
that's a that's a big responsibility. This should be just an auto resolve if he doesn't retreat. All right, boom, easy auto resolve. Probably took very small amounts of damage, not a big deal. So I can get plus one combat strength on all my units or plus 10 food on all my cities. I'm gonna take plus 10 food on all my cities. That extra food will add up to a couple of extra population over the next 10 turns, which will add up to extra resources in quite a lot of my cities in a lot of ways. My gold and influence should start to skyrocket here, uh, which will be helpful because these are actually the two the two um, stars that I've been having the hardest time getting. The other ones I've been having a pretty good time. Now I can optionally choose to sit here and pillage some of these things, but I think my objective in this war is to actually basically completely conquer the Mycenaeans. So we're gonna go, we're gonna go hard and push straight for their cities and see if we can put them under siege and start flipping them. Another new civic has appeared, army wages. We have the, oh, okay. We can choose to go for extra money from ransacking and extra combat strength when we're ransacking, which would move us more in the direction of world. Or we can opt for paid wages, which would give us extra stability when we occupy a city and extra stability on our garrisons. I don't have garrisons and I don't plan to do any ransacking, but these are interesting choices. I feel like um, one of the big things they've done since the betas was actually make the choices more interesting. And I th I, that's an achievement in my opinion, because it is, it is hard to make choices more interesting. A lot of people think that that's like a, a non-trivial or a, a fairly trivial task, but it's actually quite non-trivial to, to make choices in a game more interesting, right? Let's put Gnosis or Gnosis under siege and we'll build ourselves a battering ram or two. And then we'll get these guys. I'll instantly resolve it because it's just a quick, easy kill. These guys are a little bit hurt, so I'll probably send them off to heal and you'll join them. So we've got our satraps palaces here in Thebes. I think I can fit one more in here. Why there? A little bit confusing. Why you want it right there? I mean, I'll do it right here instead. Get that Satraps Palace online. More gold, more influence. Siege Tactics is finished, so we can have larger armies. And we can also build Ballistas. Now that we can build Ballistas, I will open my Siege. And we're building Ballistas instead of Battering Rams, which is perfect. Let's get both of these guys out of this territory and into this river. Ideally on the same tile, like Skadoosh. So now I can have five units in a single army. And these guys will all heal up together now, which is exactly what we want to see. Oh, wait a minute. Do my units regenerate in enemy territory thanks to Temple of Artemis? If so, that's really powerful. I thought that might have only applied to my own territory, but it looks like it applies everywhere. The Maya have sent me an alliance proposal. I am going to be allies with the Mayans because they're the underdogs. Absolutely. Ah, if I break this badge, they want a cultural agreement. Uh, cultural agreements will give me 5% empire influence. Yeah, hell yeah. 5% influence? Pfft, why wouldn't I take that? I should totally buy all of their resources though, because resources are valuable. How do these guys feel about me buying their resources? I can buy their gemstones. 300, Jesus Christ. Saffron now has a lot of applicability because I actually have some some farmer's quarters. 300 gold per saffron, Jesus. And actually these gemstones now have a lot of applicability because I'm building satrap palaces which means there's potentially a good scaling amount of gold from buying these. So I'll get more of those as time goes on. Man, I've almost already researched all the technology in the classical era. I might have to just age up because I have nothing left to research. So we have a ballista now. Um, do I want to... Do, 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 do. I, think, I think I just sit and get more ballistas because that seems like awesome as hell. There's going to be a massive battle here. I get these guys to heal up a little then get them to come join the battle too, because they can join in over here. Yeah. All right, we'll wait another turn before we initiate that siege. Maybe get another ballista or two. We've got a bunch of satraps palaces here. So building more market quarters is actually more viable for me now, if I wanted to in the city. Stability has gone down a little bit, and I don't have any of the basic food infrastructure in here and stuff like that. So this city is growing re relatively slowly. So let's grab the animal barns, which gives me food based on the number of horses I have. And we'll also grab the granary, which gives me extra food from my farmers. And then the flood irrigation, which gives me food from my rivers. So all three of those together should give me up somewhere in the region of like 20 to 50 food, depending on how it all works out. And um, a lot of that food actually scales quite well into the middle and late game. Nice. We got a merchant star. Very cool. Let's get this army to join the siege. And then next turn, I think we can actually get them to to actually expand this battlefield. So just give me a sec. All right, boom. Now they're in. They are losing units relatively quickly. They have a large amount of reinforcements. I reckon I can declare this battle next turn and have like a really, really fun time with this fight. Uh, Memphis has finished building most of its satraps palaces. 
I wanted to get this one, but maybe that's not the move. Maybe I just put it here and accept. It's just going to be in a little bit of a weird spot. I do have 2000 influence now, so I can continue to expand my capital. And I want my capital to be like a giga huge mega city. So I'm going to nab all this land here. Um, so we'll start with Avior. Boom. Join the Republic. And we will put a Satraps Palace on here too. Boosh. Then we'll eventually, uh, I think next turn, we'll have Kurha join. Nice. We have full gold agrarian stars, full gold scientist stars. One more territory gets me an expansionist star. Uh, foreign outpost research. Cool. If I come in, a scientist star. Oh man. Yes. We're like, we're hitting all the numbers. This feels amazing. Uh, I want to attach this territory. Boom. There's the expansionist star. So now I'm at a point where I'm ready to go. All I have to do is fight this battle and I will hit um, another gold star and my score is already insane compared to the AI and I'm playing I'm not playing on the lowest difficulty I'm playing on like a medium difficulty here and just goes to show with a little bit of game knowledge a little bit of careful planning uh, and you know using your opportunities you can you can take control of a game here we'll, we'll consider our cultural um, advancement here next turn uh, or maybe th the end of this turn but first I'd like to fight this really really big battle because this is exciting uh, we're going to begin the assault we have three ballistas on our side we will manually fight this battle. There's a bunch of enemy reinforcements coming from this direction. So we need to choose whether or not we want to actually fight these or if we want to try and cut off those reinforcements. And just due to the awkwardness of where they're going to spawn, it might be better for me to cut them off um, because this is like high ground stuff that I'm just not going to have a good time doing. However, yeah, I think, I think I'm just going to use my chariots. Use two of my chariots to cut off most of their reinforcements. And then these scout cavalry, if they come through, that's fine. It's like, whatever. I've got my three ballistas in position. I'm more or less happy with this unit setup. Everyone's kind of in range to do something. So let's end the deployment. And because I'm the attacker, I get to go first. And I get to put these ballistas to use. So this city actually had palisades built. And you can see here... Um, siege units do damage to the unit inside the building and the actual palisade itself. Whereas if I attack with my swordsman, he only attacks the unit in the city and uh, doesn't damage the walls. This is, this is the power of siege units. So if I attack now, I do damage and lower the fortification, which makes my life easier. So you can see here, if I click on this guy, you can see um, the fortification gives him plus six combat strength. If I break those fortifications entirely, he's no longer getting the plus six combat strength from the fortification, which will allow me to enter this city much easier now because I can kill this unit. And now I'm inside the walls and walls don't apply if you're inside the city. But I can also take this unit and blast down the fortifications here too, like this. And we'll use a little... Okay, let's, let's make sure we block this. And it looks like the battlefield has actually expanded even more. So I may block this for a turn and then look to kill these three. And that actually might just be what we do. We kind of block this reinforcement spot and opt to be in position to kill these other three reinforcements. Because these all just look like cheap scout cavalry, whereas this is like proper soldiery that we don't want to we don't want to mess with. And I'll bring my um cavalry or char chariot archers over to this position to begin the fight too. That's all we need to do for this turn. We broke the city already and we have isolated most of the enemy's reinforcements so they can only bring in scout cavalry. Now they will get some good hits on me but it's mostly on the siege equipment that's going to go away after this battle anyway. So I'm not too worried if I take a little bit of um, retaliatory damage and it actually does look like they're trying to break out the um, reinforcements that I have blocked here. Now he took a big hit blocking. It is a downside to uh, blocking a reinforcement channel that you will you will take significant damage. But let's go ahead and blast this guy out of the city. So now we have full control of the city and we've broken the walls and we can use our ballistas and our archers to begin uh, dealing with some of this stuff. And I think I can move this chariot off of this now and let these guys spawn in. As long as I position carefully enough to where not too many of my units can take um, retaliation strikes from these reinforcements coming in. So let's position ourselves carefully. Oh, there's another unit down here. Ah, I didn't see you. You cheeky little, you cheeky little sausage. But I've taken control of the city center, which means if this battle goes to three rounds, I automatically win. Uh, because I've taken control of their flag. So they have to try and get that back now. 
All right, let's see the reinforcements pile in. I expect that they may not be able to bring in their full reinforcements, or if they do bring in their full reinforcements, they get inefficient attacks, because I've already sort of surrounded where the reinforcements are coming in, and it looks like the inefficient attack that I was hoping for is what happened here. They got some damage on me, but nothing decisive, which means I completely get to dictate how this next phase of the battle plays out, both in the city and over here. So let's use the ballistas while we have them. They have great range. I think the ballistas have a range of like four or something. So we can use them to nail uh, some of these like edge units, which is like the perfect use of these. So we'll step this ballista forward and shoot him. You finish him off. Perfect. He's dead. Use you to kill this cavalry. You step forward and shoot this guy in the river. Shoot the guy in the river. Shoot the guy in the river. I think that should be a triple shot. Killing him a lot. Can I get the kill with my swordsman? Yes. Awesome. Gonna fall this immortal back because he's a little bit weak. Shoot you. And then we'll just let the... We'll, we'll let the end of this round kind of play out. I think, I think we managed to do huge damage to the Mycenaeans here. Not only have we occupied their city, we managed to break apart their army and um, smash them apart. We got ourselves a militarist star. So now we have four gold stars, um, which is incredible. Really, really good. Four gold stars, a silver and two bronze. So we're heading into the medieval era with an absurd amount of fame. An absurd amount of fame. And we're crushing the only person who was even remotely in a position at any point in the game to stop us. Now the Harappans are a little bit of a problem because they're on four cities. But at the same time, I'm pretty sure that we have an ally in the um, Nubian turned uh, Mayans over here who will absolutely back us up when it comes to fighting here. And I've consolidated almost the entirety of my terrain. So I'm not even really sure if I have anything to fear. Like I can come over to Thebes and attach this very soon. But I'm going to wait till the next era. And speaking of the next era, it's time to advance our culture. And, and 30 turns ahead of schedule too, based on how well my Civ is doing. I've built all my infrastructure. I've built all, I, I've researched all the technologies. There's not really much left for me to achieve in this era. So we're definitely moving in a warlike direction with the Achaenid Persians. Maybe we could pivot to a different direction now. Um, I'm feeling like my science is strong. I'm feeling like my production is strong. I'm feeling like my city sizes is good. So let's let's take let's just take some time to like study what these guys offer. So the Aztecs give a movement unit uh, uh, blah, 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 a land unit a land unit movement speed increase. They also make your units cheaper. They offer the sacrificial altar, which gives you faith and stability and extra influence. And you can sacrifice population to increase the stability of your cities. Jaguar, Jaguar, Jaguar or Jaguar warriors are heavy infantry that are kind of like the Gezote. Quite powerful, quite powerful, high upkeep, very expensive, could be useful. This would be, I feel like, more of a religious warfare kind of direction. Not terrible. Uh, we have the Byzantines that get extra money based on their alliances. They also get the Hippodrome that gives you money based on the amount of horses you have and also gets extra money if they are adjacent to horses. And it counts as a market quarter, the Varangian Guard. Interesting. So this would be very much so a gold direction I could pivot my sieve to. And I have kind of been pivoting to a gold direction up to 365 gold per turn, which is not nothing. Like if I plug this Satrap's Palace in, I could potentially be, you know, buying one of these every now and again. I don't know how this price works. I wish I wish the relationship between the production cost of something and the price of it was like was static because I believe there is like some multiplier applied based on how long the game has gone. Although I could be completely wrong about that and completely off base. It's, some of these things I haven't tested fully and in depth. But yeah, I feel like the Byzantines would be great if I wanted to make a lot of money and do a lot of diplomacy, which eh, kind of looks OK. The Franks are good at influence and I don't know if I need much more influence. I've kind of focused heavily on influence. They do also have good science, however. Uh, just raw science and faith. Uh, the Franci Milites. Ooh, the Ghanians. Extra money per number of luxury resources. Extra money per number of strategic resources. That's really powerful. Uh, luxuries market. Extra money for every trade route. Plus three money per adjacent market quarter. Uh -huh, okay. And they get the Maharis, which is an anti-cavalry camel. It's an anti-cavalry cavalry, which is kind of interesting. So these guys would definitely be more gold makey. Uh, the Teutons are a religious sieve. So plus one money and plus one science per state religion follower. I have a lot of religion followers. Now, it's only in like the 80 to 100 region, but it's still a lot. And we can make a Kaiserdom, which would give me extra faith. Ooh, faith per district is insane. Especially 
faith per adjacent district and it counts as a maker's quarter man the kaiserdom is kind of blowing my mind right now with how good this potentially could be um you just plop that in the middle of a whole bunch of maker's quarters and boom you've an insane amount of faith um which gives you production and then translates into money and gold we've got the khmer now the khmer oh my god the khmer are so good khmer are easily my favorite save in the game um hands down servants of the magnificent they get plus three industry on their maker's quarters they get so this straight up every time you build a maker's quarter you get extra production so if you've done anything remotely productive in the last two eras going like nubians or egyptians or mayans or any of those kind of saves boom you're automatically just coming into this era with extra production um they also get the barre which is an insane insane uh district because it it's actually been nerfed here because i was playing a game with them last night i feel like this has been nerfed since i was this, uh, dude uh, they have <laughs> they are making gameplay changes in between my episodes which is totally understandable because the game is getting like last minute changes but even so even with these nerfs this barre used to be insane dude i think it used to give you production based on the number of territories in a city and that shit was crazy um so this has been nerfed and it's still incredible it's, it used to give you food based on the number of river tiles it was adjacent to and then i think it gave you production based on the number of um based on the number of territories in the city now it's a little bit more reasonable that plus one industry per population is pretty damn good uh plus five food is pretty damn good plus two industry per adjacent river is pretty damn good i still think these are going to be one of my favorite saves because they just synergize so well with a lot of the ways that i play uh, even if they're heavily nerfed like heavily nerfed this is still good <laughs> it's incredible um but i think they're literally like they're literally like trying out balance patches and th like this is all recorded pre-release um which is really really cool i'm excited to see how the balance shakes out the english have had some changes in uh, you know since since the last time we've seen them they get plus seven food per number of territories attached on city or outposts so this kind of helps if you've gone a little bit taller it helps you grow your city's more population which is quite good so you need a little, you need a few less farmers quarters which means that production can go towards other things the stronghold has been significantly upgraded it counts as a farmer's quarter and a uh, garrison all in one this is like a super district now and it also increases the range of any unit standing on it by plus two so if you put a longbowman on that tile it's a six range unit it can just dominate the battlefield insane and then the mongols okay the mongols are where like the nomadic horde people become insane because 100 percent ransack gains you get extra money when you're ransacking which actually turns into food when you're playing the mongol hordes which means you gray goo even mo more of these units <sighs> and the order is like the outpost uh the umayyads have the grand mosque which gives you a ton of science very very strong science guys norsemen are more of like naval warfare stuff they have the naust which is a um harbor that gets you money based on the number of ransacks you do and it counts as a farmer's quarter and a market quarter quite powerful i would say quite powerful for growing your cities quite tall but i think of all all of the things the khmer are my favorite i just i love playing the khmer you get to use the ballista elephant it's insane it moves it shoots it's you know it's an elephant with a goddamn siege weapon on its back what more could you want the extra production it's insane i love the khmer they're my favorite oh man they were so worried like i was crushing them so hard that they they decided right now that surrendering was better than letting me kind of play the game out let's see here i automatically have to take these three but yeah it looks like they saw the writing on the wall they're losing cities they're in battle i think i'm gonna take their land so this is the war resolution screen and basically how this works is you are able to offer surrender terms now if you declared a war with specific grievances highlighted if you remember they attacked me and i was like hey you have to pay me for attacking me you have to pay me for attacking me that's these three things here so i will get three thousand gold out of this no matter what but i can i can kind of extend my demands i can say i want this territory of al-qaeda here right so i can say i want you to give me this and this costs a certain amount of grievances or, or, or these um not grievances sorry it's like war score it costs a certain amount of war score and maybe i also want lion rock so i can just take a whole this this whole chunk of their territory al-qaeda lion rock and gnosis from this war so i'm taking a city and two territories from them then any leftover remaining war support is converted into a gold at a 10 to 1 ratio this is i think it's a really nice peace deal mechanic I have only a couple of small issues with it, but basically most of my issues stem from, it's a little bit too limiting, I would say, 
but it, it achieves what they want to achieve, which I think is good. And that's like a sacrifice you have to make as a player and as a designer. Okay, I, I wish I could like, I'm currently looking at my bunny rabbit and she's like lying fully on her side, licking her chest and then pointing her head in the air as if she's like, it's so weird. Eve, you're not normal. I love you, but you're not normal. Um, what was I saying? The UI could use a little bit of work. I mean, you can kind of, you can kind of zoom to territory, but I, I, I think it might actually be down to the fact that I have my UI scaled up a little bit, but this could work a little bit better, I feel like. Um, I'm going to force that surrender. I take all three of the territories I highlighted. Now we own all of this. And then also uh, both of our war support goes to zero. So we can't actually declare war on each other for a little while. We have to get our war support up above a certain value which can happen based on us, you know, triggering grievances against each other. They would like to trade luxuries. I'm going to accept that deal because if they buy my luxuries, that's fine. I'll buy theirs even. Like, there you go. But I'm probably going to be looking for reasons to attack them. Ah, new civic, a cultural blessing. So we can go for monoculturalism, which gives me extra stability across my empire based on the number of territories in my cities. Or I can go for multicultural multiculturalism which gives me extra influence based on the number of territories in my cities i think i would rather go for the stability here just because my influence is already so good and that would be a relatively small amount of influence i think in my opinion if i were to give a little bit of feedback to the developers this should be like plus two um plus two plus three and then it would be good i think most of the time monoculturalism is just going to be better with the exception of if you want to really 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 badly move towards this growth thing but you almost always want to move towards this combat strength thing anyway because it's a, it's a straight up better um plus one combat strength is huge so i would say this needs to be a little bit stronger let's see here gnosis not a lot I can do in here because the city is in mutiny. So we'll just do some basic construction and wait for the city to be useful. We'll do our final technology research. We'll grab ourselves craftsmanship and we'll head into the next era. We're met with another movie. I'm going to skip it again because I want you guys to experience that on your own when you play the game for yourselves. We can claim new wonders. I'm very excited about that potential. Anchor Wat is available. Oh, man, I kind of have to build Anchor Wat as the, the Khmer, right? It's not Khmer, it's Khmer. I keep forgetting that there's like a correct way to pronounce the Khmer. Uh, but this gives me plus one food per faith, which is huge, by the way, when you consider how much faith I'm generating. We have the Forbidden City, which gives us extra war support when going to war. This can be helpful to buy you more time in wars because wars are dictated based on war support. The Todai Ji is faith, stability, and it makes it harder to convert your civs, religion, and culture. And then those are the three here, actually. The Mayans would like a scientific agreement. And this gives me a scientific 5% science boost across my whole empire, which seems pretty good. Yeah, let's do a customs union with these guys too, to make buying resources from each other much cheaper. So I think, I think I'm ride or die with the Mayans here. I've, ma I've made my ally. I've, I've decided how I'm how I'm dealing with the world, but my, my empire is massive and all powerful now in this world. And again, this is why I, this is why I recommend you play in a smaller world because the diplomacy is a little bit less complex, right? When there's only three people in the game, you can be like ally one, kill one, uh, ignore the other, which is kind of like the um, <laughs> the fuck marry kill <laughs> of, uh, of of humankind, right? Um, so I actually want to talk a little bit about about the barre and its power as a river improvement. I mean, holy sweet Jesus Christ. Look at this. This was nerfed, by the way. This was nerfed, okay? And it's still the best improvement in the game, okay? And I'll accept no other answer. Um, this is going to give me 25 food and 47 production. I need to immediately build it everywhere that it's available, everywhere that it's powerful. 17, 17 food and 53 production. You were trying to tell me this sieve ain't broke. You're wrong. Get woke, get broke, play the Khmer, okay? I'm telling you, dude, 20 food, 46 production. Oh, it's, dis it's disgusting. 20 food, 46 production. And then we do another one and another. Where, where do I do it? Oh man, look at, it's just, it's, abs it's absurdly good. It's so good. I have like uh, so many of these queued up. I'm also, I'm going to queue up an aqueduct like maybe halfway through to get me a bit more stability. <laughs> to try to make up for the fact that my food and production in this city is just about to go insane. I'm excited. I'm, ex I'm excited 
for the possibility of, of my capital. I, I need to do the same thing in like all my cities, but they're not quite as good in all these other cities. Like they're okay. I, I could maybe skip them. The plus one industry per population is pretty powerful. And the fact that they work a lot of tiles is like pretty good. And they can be like a bridge between maker's quarters and farmer's quarters. So I'd say these are okay. They're like not bad. I'd build them. I'd build them everywhere. It makes sense. Honestly, they're just so good. Just get them. All right. We have access to the charcoal, charcoal kiln and the artisan workshop. The charcoal kiln makes maker's quarters better and makes them better if they're adjacent to maker's quarters. And then the artisan quarter makes our industry workers better, which is pretty cool. Looks like we're under attack. I'm just going to instantly resolve that. Uh, and it's time to build more of these insane barres, dude. Oh God, look at this. 27 production. Oh, you know what? Maker's Quarter right there. And then Barre right there on that river. That's so good. 28 production, dude. It's crazy. It's crazy. You don't, you don't even need a river. Like, you don't need a river for this to be a good tile improvement. 32 production. Jesus. I'm just... Now, I'm only really following the... Um, I'm following the advice of the game as I play, right? It says, oh, you should place that here. So I'm placing it here. A more advanced player might be able to make better decisions about where exactly these tile improvements should go. But I'm just putting them where the game is like, this is a good spot. I'm like, okay, I believe you. So now we have a whole host of new technology. We can work on feudalism, which will give us colony models. If we were playing in a game that wasn't Pangea and maybe had a new world where you could go and settle new cities, colony model might be useful. Plus one food on tiles producing food could be really good for growing taller population. So let's get to work on feudalism. Oh, civics osmosis. So this is a thing whereby when there's two cultures blending, like you can see here, there's two sort of influence spheres blending. Sometimes you can get an osmosis event, which allows your population to basically make demands. Now, if I replace this, um, my ideological proximity with the Mycenaeans will increase and I'll also get this and it won't cost me influence but if I refuse it will make this city very unhappy now currently I have professional soldiers plugged in so if I were to cancel professional soldiers and plug in conscripts that would give that would like completely shift my empire in a, in a different direction so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna make the executive decision to refuse this at the cost of stability for 10 turns but I think that's a worthwhile endeavor so you've also got a civics osmosis here this is for communal rights now I don't actually have procession uh, I don't have personal rights either so I don't mind this maybe moving towards this direction plus it'll give me an extra five percent industry if I accept this so I'm going to come in here and enact this because it won't cost me influence to do and it will prevent any negative events here. I right, pox on the wind. Oh, so we have some sort of plague coming through the world. Well, we know how well things went when we ignored it. Let's uh, <laughs> let's make the decision to uh, lock down here for 10, 10 turns. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we overreacted, but, uh, you know. I'd rather not suffer the bad consequences. Having lived through a plague that is currently happening, I'm choosing quarantine every time. All right, so we got Imperial Power, uh, which gives us access to the Commons Quarter, re relocating our capital and the Customs Farm, which is cool because it is a bridge tech. Oh, a world deal, deed. Oh, this was a world deed. I haven't actually checked in on the world deeds here, and there's quite a few of them. So it looks like the Greeks were the first to build a wonder uh cultured land is to spread your influence through an entire continent i must be close to pulling that off sacred ground nuclear weapons test Ooh, there's lots of really cool stuff you can do here we found mount roraima own a nuclear weapon bread and games imperial power discover movable typeface discover 100 percent of the world Ooh, i'd like to do that quite a few of these things you can do and this is just really really cool they've they've taken like important little chunks of human history and turned them into video game mechanics and that's that's really what these kind of like historical 4X games are about for me. It's like, ooh, do I get to like play through history in an interesting way? And for this game, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. All right, great. This city is coming along nicely considering it has been given very little to no attention. It's up to 40 food surplus, has 10 population, over 100 production. I'm going to get some of my basic what you call them, like luxury stuff online so I can get more stability and then start to develop the city a little bit more. It's the same with Hagmatana, actually. Uh, we just finished our Bares, which puts the city in a very, very strong position. And we have our two harbors. So it might be good for me to consider like a Quadrireme to send exploring. So I'll get a Quadrireme. I'll, I'll even pay money to get it right now. 
Um, and then it might be in my interest to look towards improving the city in some other ways because it's making an insane amount of food and an insane amount of production. So maybe if I build a little bit more of this infrastructure, uh, food on harbors, money on harbors, like get all these things going, we'll end up with a very, very powerful city food and production wise, which will typically snowball. It's like, I can, I can be greedy, okay? I own half of the world. This is like the perfect time to be greedy. Now, the question is, do I want Hagmatana to own Peepolter? Or do I want a cad to own Peepolter? And I think I want a cad to own Peepolter. Let's see, 21. I'm probably not going to be able to meet the territory star this era. But now a cad is like in the center of my empire. It's just like big, boxy, huge city with a couple of little tendrils. And I'm, I'm very excited about what I might be able to do with a cad. Actually, I could spend gold to finish these barres. Boom. 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 And that got me a builder star. So I just spent a ton of that money that I've been saving up for a long time to turn a cad into like a giga city. Look at the food. Look at the production. Up to 300 production in here, which is massive. Um, so we'll spend a couple turns getting our stability up. Getting those luxuries. We've been neglecting our luxuries for a very long time, which we super should not have been. We got an agrarian start, man. We are currently, when it comes to like builder, agrarian and technology, these are the three that we are just like absolutely killing it on. And we will set this quadrireme to auto explore. Let it just explore the coastline for me. Discover the world. Ah, land rights. So land rights allows us to choose between two possibilities, inherited land or communal land. Uh, communal land will move us more towards collectivism, which increases our production. Inherited land moves us more towards individualism, which increases our money. I kind of am already personally leaning towards the collectivism for the production because production is king. I love money or I love production rather. And this gives me plus 10 food per number of attached territories in all cities, which kind of also works with my game plan. It gives me a lot of food. Allows cities to claim, attach and merge territories with money instead of influence. This is less exciting for me. So I think I'm going to enact communal land and just get all that free food from expanding my territory because I have actually cities that have a reasonable number of territories already attached. So that's going to result in a lot of population growth and a lot of food for me. I have the builder ability again, actually. So if I wanted to like build a wonder, what I could do is like, say, pick the anchor watt, right? I'm going to claim the anchor watt. Boom, claimed. Then if I come into Memphis, I'll queue it up just for memes. I'll put it, you can't put it on a mountain, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll put it like, here and now if i click this button i'll put the city into builder mode and they could build it really really fast but i'm not going to do that i'm going to finish my bar raise first man i could use 30 population to finish this instantly that i feel like needs to be balanced i don't think this should take 30 population that seems like an awful lot considering you can grow like maximum one population per turn that seems a little bit like crazy talk to me oh yeah look at this this is the god spot it's going to work all of this river i remember this gets extra industry for every river that's adjacent to it. So this is like the perfect barre around a loop of river. Awesome. Oh yeah, I meant to, I meant to assimilate sis. How do I, mm. there is a way to merge cities and that's something I might want to consider doing. Now I want military architecture. So I'll start working on military architecture because this has the absorb city ability, which allow me to merge some of these maybe smaller, less useful cities together into one larger city. Uh, they also have access to the fort, which I, uh, you know, this makes your cities more defensible by giving them combat strength and vision range. And it also actually gives me access to my unique unit, the Danvi Gaja, which is the Ballista Elephant and the Trebuchet. I love the Trebuchet. So if I take a look at the city, um, it's probably going to merge with Sus or Seuss. Thebes is going to take Felis, I think. So we'll come over to Thebes and we'll attach Felis to it and pop down a couple more barres in here. Now, what do I want to do in here? Oh man, it's been like super windy. Man, these headphones are so powerful. I can't even hear that wind behind me. Let me, uh, let me go fix that. Stability in here is in a great place and I don't even have a public fountain. If I look at the Fims map mode, there's quite a good bit of like food land out here. So that could be worthwhile to spend a bit of time maybe getting a few farmers outposts here. I don't have amazing spots. Actually, I do have two great spots for, for market quarters which might be the thing to do in here. Yeah, let's dedicate a little bit of this land to uh, a couple of market quarters around this um, sage. So Akkad has finished building all of its barres. 
very very powerful it's having a little bit of a stability issue so i'm just gonna throw down a shrine here because shrines give you stability and i'll just pop it right there Ooh, a new civic industrial production so plus one farmer slot on city per farmer's quarter or plus one trader slot on city per market interesting this is actually very heavily affecting with the ideology of my civilization farmer slots i don't think matter so much to me the commons quarter kind of matters to me i don't know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna make these decisions just yet ah we got feudalism awesome so we can now when we settle cities we start with a little bit of extra infrastructure is there a place i can show you this i think so but we also have crop rotation which will give me more food if i come into here that's too expensive. But you can see here, uh, evolve outpost to city. So now it starts with three population, starts with 140 production, like in the tank, ready to use. And it also starts with all of the infrastructures from era one and two. So that means if we kind of see this diagonal slice, everything to the left of it, that is like one of um, one of these things, like the customs farm, our new cities will spawn with all of that infrastructure, I believe. But it does make settling new cities more expensive. I think. Therefore, I am. I'd like to know a little bit more about this part of the coastline. So I'm going to send my ship kind of in this direction. Because I want to know, maybe I could have like a little island chain city over here. Nice, we got a builder star from building all those districts. Exciting. We just need another... Uh, what is this? 14, 14 districts and we get another builder star. The rest of these we can pick up pretty passively. Oh, interesting. So this heads up marker is a thing you can do to tell people, hey, look, by the way, I'm interested in your like cedar wood, which is, um, ah, it's like a communication tool for other players. That's cool. I like that because the AI had been doing it to me and I was like, why is the AI putting like these little symbols on me? And they were just saying, hey, listen, I'm interested in buying this strategic resource off you or uh, luxury resource or whatever it was. All right, we got a pair of market quarters down here and it can be worth it to build uh, things like market quarters. I feel like it can be worth it to build them in little triangles because if you look at them, they get plus one money for every adjacent market quarter. So if you build them in a little triangle, that is the like smallest uh, sort of like Tetris piece nugget of things that gets the maximum adjacency bonus. Because it means that like if you build two market quarters, right, and they're both adjacent to each other, you'll get one gold from each which is pretty good. You get two gold. But if you build three market quarters and they're all adjacent to each other, you get two gold from each. So you go from from, from a 50% investment increase, you go from, uh, you, get, you get three times the return. And that is also true if we build the food market here, which also will scale off of that. So we'll get another six gold if we build this. So doing these things has the potential to actually net us a lot and then you can go for a diamond and make them even bigger and make like a whole quad and i don't know there's lots of interesting things you can do with district adjacency basically taking care of stability here let's grab some basic infrastructure what do i do with the city uh, it's got a lot of territory it's got a shrine uh, it's got a lot of food a lot of production so i think infrastructure helps at scale so charcoal kiln artisan workshop market quarter gold Agrarian star, beautiful. Let's get those bar rays in this newly conquered city. Boom. And the other really cool thing about the bar ray is because it is a maker's quarter at a farmer's quarter, if you imagine that, like, let's say, um, can I find a piece of terrain that's like a good example here? A nice clean piece of terrain. Like, yeah, over over here. Let's say you had like, I want to put marker's quarters on like all of the, or, or um, farmer's quarters on like all of these tiles. And I want to put maker's quarters on all of these tiles. But if you have access to the bar ray, you can like put it here and all of your farmer's quarters will get adjacency from the bar ray, but so will your maker's quarters. So the, the bar ray, because it's a dual purpose district, it actually acts as a really cool bridge to transition, um, you know, your terrain from one set of district types to another. 
So that's something to consider how you might want to be using it too. And also it's just generally powerful because it works. Um, rivers typically have both food and production and the barway works food and production. So therefore you're getting the maximum yield from the river. Whereas if I were to see the seven production tile, if I put a farmer's quarter down on that, it, it erases the, the production, which is not ideal. Not, not really. So this city is, is becoming fairly well developed. It's, it's, it's growing population really quickly. And a city that's growing population really quickly needs more job slots because this thing is, just, it is, it is growing up to 71% production. So anything in here that gives a job slot, I'm going to take. And it looks like I get two researcher jobs from the House of Scribes. And maybe I can specialize this city towards uh, maybe a little bit of gold. Ooh, I could erase, I could erase a little bit of production here, but there's a lot of gold potential around these luxuries. I give up some production, sure. And that sucks. But I pick up so much gold in exchange that it, it feels worth it to me to move in that kind of a gold direction. Uh, the Battle for the Mind. So I can pick up Learning, which is 15 signs per city for 10 turns. Fanatical, which is extra faith. Or I could just pick up an extra bit of um, gold. I think this 15 signs per city is kind of insane for me considering how massive my empire is. Uh, I'm making 100, 485 signs right now. And if I upgrade this, it's up to 500. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm scaling really well right now to the point where I can probably hit late game by like turn two, 120 if I play this correctly. But we're, we're playing like fairly high level. I'm trying to explain my decisions relatively in depth. So we've got Thebes over here. They just finished building all my emblematic quarters and the stability in here is tanking. It's trending downwards very rapidly. So I'm going to go ahead and get to work on an aqueduct. That should bring the stability up. And I could also build a garrison or two, or I could get to work on something like a commons quarter. If I place a commons quarter here, this is worth 10 stability. And then maybe I could use it as a point to build around. Now they've changed commons quarters a little bit. It used to be that commons quarters were kind of like generic districts, but now you want to like dot them around your empire because they don't get stability from each other. And Commons Quarters actually act as a good bridge between two types of terrain as well. So for example, if you look here, I have a piece of terrain that like makes food and then another piece of terrain that makes production. So like a Commons Quarter on one or more of these tiles actually seems pretty reasonable to me. So I'll put a Commons Quarter like right there and then I'll try to surround it to get extra value. So we'll see how the city looks when we're back. Nice, we've got military architecture so we can merge cities now. We have access to forts and trebuchets and all that great stuff. Another era star unlocked. Awesome. Three more technologies, a little bit more pop and a little bit more districts. And we're there. Uh, Seuss, I think it's time for you to be absorbed. I have taken this into my, my empire. And then with Hurricana, I'm actually going to fully absorb it next turn. Um, so all of these districts will actually be absorbed into Hurricana, which means there's going to be a big stability problem in here. Um, so I think a shrine is, is in order in Hurricana because that would just make up for the fact that I'm about to take a big stability hit. And I also get uh, a nice boost to my army size here from capturing Zeus. So it's always worth it to take over a city-state, even if you immediately just liberate it again. Quadririm is in position. Let's have a little look around at these islands. I'm going to break off a swordsman to get into the water and uh, maybe start outposting these. But now that I can merge cities, I, I may consider merging Hagmatana and Gnosis together eventually because they would be like a massive coastal city here. And then I could take Memphis and merge this. I, I have a massive coastal city. I like the idea of, of bigger cities in the late game. Bigger cities in the late game appeal to me a lot. All right, let's begin our network of districts. So I think a commons quarter here and then a maker's quarter here and then a commons quarter here, a farm and so on. So in order to continue to expand the city, we're going to need a mixture of commons quarters, maker's quarters and farmer's quarters and stuff like that to keep the city expanding rapidly and reasonably. Although actually, this is like one of the few viable places for scientific districts. It's a lot of production to miss out on, but I think it's worth. All right, cool. Mounted warfare. Uh, I think I think we just go in here and we just queue up like some old text. Anything cheaper than like three turns we just queue up to get them done it's time to enter a new era let's have a look am i ready to enter into a new era three more techs i think i would want like at least i think i at least want a bronze star in a steed, a gold star in agrarian a gold star in builder 
and a silver star in scientist and then i think i'm happy to go at advance i kind of wish ui wise i kind of wish i had the ability to like like left click these to say okay i want to finish these ones that like prioritize these and then that would like so i could like basically make a note of that this is what i wanted to do um yeah but i think we've made significant progress our empire is massive our empire is huge we're absolutely steamrolling and running away with the game i'm going to call it there for this episode i love you all very much and i'll see you guys next time Bye-bye.